everyone. In the name of the LabEx Scientific Council, I'm happy to, to announce the following of our seminar series with prestigious invited speakers. Till our health situation will improve, the seminars will be set up by web conference only. Today, I'm especially honored to receive Professor Manoli Kellis directly from the MIT at Harvard in the USA. Professor Kellis has been invited by Patrick Brest from the Institute for Research on Cancer and Aging in Nice. Before starting our conference, I, I'd like to give some practical information. First, the seminar will be registered and, will be, and you will have access to it. Uh, we'll, we'll give you information for that after the conference. Second, uh, during the talk, your camera and microphones will be shut down automatically. And third, uh, you'll be able to ask questions in French, in English, in Greek also, if you want. <laughs> Uh, either during the conference by writing into the chat directly or after the conference by raising your hand. Now, I wish you a nice seminar. And uh, now, uh, Patrick Bress will introduce briefly Professor Kellis. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, it's my real pleasure to introduce you, Manolis Kellis. So, it's a professor at Advart. And um, Actually, I've followed, uh, so, uh, ma uh, sorry, Manolis Kelis has done a, a short period in France, actually, in uh, Aix-en-Provence, if I remember correctly. And then after you switch directly to uh, USA, when you started your PhD uh, in 20 years ago. And, uh, and then directly after your thesis, I guess you, you stay for a few uh, months uh, postdoc, and then you, you were directly nominated as a professor at uh, Harvard University. So to, to tell all the people that uh, they recognize in you a uh, real talent. Uh, and, uh, and then during the, over the, the last 20 years, actually, you, you, you did a tremendous uh, publication in nature, science, on a uh, very focused on, on uh, genetics and, uh, and uh, sequence alignment and, uh, and with your whole consortium and uh, you, you provide us a lot of tools that we are using uh, every day, I will say, in the lab, uh, like JTEX uh, and other tools in, of the, from the Broad Institute. So I know I, I think that you started also to do some uh, uh, artificial intelligence as well. So a lot of things to, to discuss to, together. <laughs> So thank you very much for, for accepting this invitation, and uh, we are really uh, honored to, to listen to you now. Merci à vous pour cette très belle invitation, et je serai très très honoré de, de, de répondre aux questions en français ou en grec ou en anglais bien sûr. Et vous pouvez les taper directement sur le chat ou uh, en tant que question. Uh, so uh, je vais partager mon écran. Hi everyone. So uh, again, it's a real pleasure to be here. What I'll be talking about today is our efforts in translating genetic variation into therapeutic insights. And specifically, how do we dissect disease circuitry at single cell resolution and how we can use that to manipulate disease phenotypes and to be able to actually reverse human disease. It all starts with genetics. Why genetics? Because genetics gives us causality because the genetic variants that we are born with, that we have inherited, are not a consequence of the disease. So when they're correlated with disease, we have perhaps the cleanest evidence of causality that in fact, a manipulation that recapitulates the effect of the genetic variant will ultimately have a causal consequence of the disease phenotype. And therefore, if we understand the mechanism through which these genetic variants act, we will be able to ultimately develop therapeutics that can reverse the disease phenotypes through these particular mechanisms. So that's the promise of genetics. The promise of genetics is that we can start with genome-wide association studies. Here's a Manhattan plot for body mass index, a measure of obesity, that revealed back in 2007 that obesity, in fact, has a genetic basis. That is not just your fault. It's not what you eat. It's not whether you exercise or not. That there, in addition to those two extremely important variables, there are genetic predeterminants for obesity. And this FTO locus was discovered, giving great hope 
that one day we will be able to, able to understand how that locus acts and ultimately develop new target genes, new therapeutics, and enable precision medicine and personalized medicine. The challenge, of course, is that when you look within this region of association, there are 89 common variants, none of which is in fact impacting a protein coding gene in that region. And in fact, that's not an exception, that's the rule. Across hundreds of thousands of genome-wide association study results, more than 120,000 loci have been discovered so far, and 93% of them are in fact not implicating a protein directly. Instead, they're acting in the known coding regions of the genome. So that basically means that we don't actually know the target gene. In this particular lo uh, locus, the association lies entirely within this FTO gene. So many people made the unfortunately incorrect assumption that FTO must be the gene through which this region is acting. But what we showed in our own work is that the true target of the association is in fact 1.2 million nucleotides away, several genes over, and 600,000 nucleotides, again, several genes over in the IRX3 and IRX5 genes. So that basically means that even in loci, in disease loci, where we have a single gene, we can't even believe that that's the true gene target. And in many cases, it will not be. That also means that we don't know the causal variant. Since none of them disrupt the protein directly, we don't really know which one of them might actually be driving the disease, which also basically means that we don't actually know the cell type where these genetic variants might be acting because this one might be active in, I don't know, liver, this one might be active in heart, this one might be active in the brain, in muscle cells, and so on and so forth. That also means we don't know the relevant pathways and that also means we don't know the mechanism. So that's the challenge ahead of us. And that's why my talk is about circuitry of disease because the goal now is to take these non-coding genetic variants that are associated in a causal fashion with disease and try to understand how do they act what are their targets? Who are their upstream regulators? What is the circuitry of that locus? And we wanna do that across all human tissues and at single cell resolution. So how do we do that? The way that we do that in my lab is that we start with genetic variation across common and rare disease. So these Manhattan plots that I showed you earlier that show for every dot, which is a, a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, what is the genomic location of that dot across the 23 pairs of chromosomes? And what is the association in the negative log 10 p-value of a chi-square test for the y-axis? We start with genetics and then we interpret the genetics. How? By profiling RNA, which is of course the transcriptome, the ultimate output of the genome that will be translated into the protein and carry out the gene function. And of course, the epigenome. What is the epigenome? <clears throat> the epigenome is the collection of modifications on top of the genome. So epi in Greek means on top of, that modify and modulate the interpretation of the DNA. It comes in three forms, DNA methylation directly on CPG dinucleotides, DNA accessibility, through the positioning of the nucleosomes that allow different transcription factors and regulators to bind the DNA and turn on a particular gene in a particular cell type. And then by far the richest are the histone modifications that happen in the nucleosomes uh, that DNA is wrapped around. So eight histone proteins form each nucleosome and they have these long amino acid tails that can be post translationally modified to indicate enhancers, which I'm gonna be showing in orange that are long range acting, super highly tissue specific elements, promoters that I'm gonna be showing in red that are the proximal gene regulatory regions that tell RNA polymerase where to start transcribing a particular gene. And then transcribed regions, when the polymers actually goes through, there are specific marks that denote each of these segments. So we can use the epigenomic information to interpret the gene regulatory status of every cell and every cell type in the genome and use the RNA transcriptional output together to understand how they relate these genetic variations ultimately to molecular variation between different uh, cell types and also between different individuals. 
So what we do is that we profile both RNA and DP genome across many different tissues of the body, but also across many individuals, both healthy individuals, to understand how genetic variation correlates with molecular variation, but also across disease individuals to understand how both genetic and non-genetic contributors ultimately lead to the intermediate molecular variation that will have an impact on disease. So we integrate these massive, massive data sets between genetic information, transcriptional information, and epigenomic information into machine learning models and computational models that allow us to find patterns in the DNA that correlate with these differences to understand what are the driver genes, what are the regions that are causal, what are the cell types, who are the upstream regulators that act in all of these loci in the context of disease. And ultimately, we validate our predictions in human cells and in mouse models, disseminate the results and start all over again. So we run a combined experimental and computational group that allows us to close that entire loop, both within my lab and in several collaborations in specific disease areas. Ultimately, what this information gives us is the circuitry. So we go from a region of association. Here's a linkage to equilibrium block that is associated with cholesterol. And then we can expand this out into what are the specific genetic variants that are associated with the specific genetic signal in that locus. Where are those genetic variants located in terms of enhancer regions that I previously told you were gonna be shown in orange? And what cell types and tissues are these enhancers active in? In this particular case, they act in liver. And who are the upstream regulators that are predicted to control these enhancer regions? And lastly, what are the downstream target genes that are changing their activity? And notice here, if this is the target, uh, the causal variant, or if that is the causal variant, if that is the causal variant, we have very different predictions as to what are the downstream target genes in this locus that, as you can see, can lie far away from that region of association. To take that example that I showed you in the first slide and tell you what this circuitry allows us to do, in this New England Journal of Medicine paper, led by Melina Klausenster and several other collaborators in multiple labs across both Europe and Canada and the US, we were able to show that this FTO locus can be narrowed down from 89 common variants down to a single nucleotide alteration that changes a T in this AT rich motif into a C in the risk individuals. And that T to C alteration, that single nucleotide alteration, causes this AT-rich interacting domain protein, ARID5B, which is a repressor to no longer be able to bind within this super enhancer that is 12,000 nucleotides long and that acts in the pre-adipocytes that then mature into either fat storing white adipocytes or fat burning brown or beige adipocytes inside our fat stores. So that decision, that developmental decision in the first three days of differentiation of pre-adipocytes from mesenchymal stem cells, ultimately to either white or beige adipocytes is determined by this particular circuitry, which is disrupted by that one nucleotide variant in the FTO locus. Now, when that regulator, that repressor, can no longer bind this super enhancer to repress it, that super enhancer gets overactivated, and in turn, it overactivates IRX3 and IRX5, two downstream genes that are 600,000 nucleotides and 1.2 million nucleotides away from this locus. And those genes we showed are master regulators of a process known as thermogenesis. And thermogenesis is heat generation. And it's basically a process through which our cells can choose to burn the excess calories in our diet rather than to store them for a rainy day. So why are we excited about this? Because when you reveal the circuitry, you can manipulate the circuitry in order to, re to reverse the disease phenotypes. And that's what we did. We basically were able to show that increasing or decreasing the expression of the upstream regulator ARID5B 
or increasing or decreasing the expression of either downstream gene, IRX3 or IRX5. In fact, led like a switch to a shift between lean phenotypes and obese phenotypes at the molecular level and at the cellular level. And even more remarkably, using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to shift that single nucleotide alteration from the risk locus to the non-risk locus shifted to, to lean, and from the non-risk to the risk shifted to obese phenotypes. So that basically means that we have the full circuitry. And why is that exciting? Because we can now go and see what is the impact at the cellular level and what is the impact at the organismal level of these changes. And what we see is that even at the cellular level, thermogenesis measured as the oxygen consumption rate as a percent of basal in both unstimulated and in stimulated conditions went from completely lack of thermogenesis, inability to burn calories, to a complete restoration, a complete rescue of the phenotype by changing from the risk to the non-risk allele in primary adipocytes from risk individuals. So we can extract the primary adipocytes from obese uh, risk individuals and restore the process of thermogenesis through that single nucleotide alteration. That is a remarkable effect. Moreover, if we take now the downstream target gene, IRX3, one of the two target genes, and we repress it, therefore moving in the opposite direction of this disease-associated mutation, we can actually shift from mice that have these abundant fat stores to mice that have completely lost all of their fat stores. And what's really remarkable is that, yes, these mice start out leaner, but much more importantly, these mice with the dominant negative form of IRX3 expressed in their adipocytes are unable to gain weight. The regular mice, the control mice, gain weight when they're put in a high fat diet. You can see this shift here, but the lean uh, mutation of changing this dominant negative IRX3 is in fact completely unable to gain any weight in a high fat diet. They don't change their exercise. They don't change their food intake. The only thing they do is they burn more calories when they're awake and when they're sleeping through the process of thermogenesis. So that's the ultimate goal. That's the reason why we want to understand the circuitry because without the circuitry, none of these experiments would be possible. It's only through the elucidation of that complete circuitry that we're able to now manipulate the disease phenotypes. Why is that exciting? Because the FTO gene itself doesn't even feature in that circuitry. And that's the beauty of circuitry. You're not just looking at a locus and saying what's under the lamppost. You're actually using the complete wiring diagram of every cell type in the body to understand the true target genes. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the tools that we have built since that paper to disseminate these results and to expand them to hundreds of thousands of genetic loci across the genome. How do we do that? We basically build reference epigenomes to predict disease relevant tissues. Then we look at variation of these in the context of both healthy and disease individuals, combining genetic, epigenetic and transcriptional variation. We then move from whole tissues to the single cell level to dissect that epigenomic and transcriptional variation across individuals in the context of disease. And then we combine these single cell data sets with genetic variation and quantitative trait loci across both single cell and bulk data set to understand the cell type specific genetic effects of these disease associated loci. We then move beyond individual phenotypes to multi-phenotype integration by integrating medical records and gene expression levels and genetic variation. And then we move from individual tissue effect to multi-tissue convergence of these effects across many different affected tissues 
in the case of obesity, cancer, AD, and aging. And lastly, we've developed extremely high throughput methods for dissecting this circuitry in very uh, high throughput parallel fashion. So let me dive right in and talk about each of these components. I'm going to talk about how reference epigenomes allow us to predict these disease relevant tissues. So in the context of the ENCODE project, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements and the Epigenomics Roadmap project and many other projects, we and many others in the community have profiled a diversity of adult and embryonic tissues, as well as embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, and in vitro differentiated cells, as well as primary cells, and multiple different regions of the brain and multiple different primary cells from these organs. And we've profiled a large number of histone modifications associated with promoters, enhancers, transcription, polycom repression, heterochromatin, activation in both promoters and enhancer regions, DNA accessibility, DNA methylation, and transcription. And we've computationally integrated all these results across more than 100 different cell types to now study the dynamics of the epigenome across the diversity of human tissues. <coughs> across immune cells, embryonic stem cells, muscle, brain, epithelial cells, heart, digestive organs, and so on and so forth. And what you can see here is that promoter regions shown in red are extremely stable. They're open even when the corresponding gene is not transcribed. You can see that some genes are very strongly repressed through these chromatin states associated with polycom repression, H3K27 trimethylation in gray. And they escape this strong repression only in a handful of cell types. You see that enhancer regions in orange are much more dynamic than promoter regions. And you also see that in cases where we want to interpret genetic variants sitting in non-coding regions and flanked by nearby genes, we can say, well, what could be the target gene of these regions? Well, let's look at what are the genes that turn on exactly when these regions turn on. And you can see here, this gene here, Pax5, is in fact turning on exactly in the same cell types as that, that region. So instead of saying, oh, it must be one of those five or six nearby genes, we can say, well, maybe the true target is in fact sitting half a million nucleotides away. And that's one of the techniques that we used in the FTO analysis. And we've now built this systematically across all 20,000 genes and 2 million regulatory regions across 800 different cell types, all publicly available. What can we do with this information? We can now turn to genome-wide association studies and say, can we systematically predict where these different traits are acting? How do we do that? We basically look at genome-wide association studies associated with height and look at all of the genetic loci shown in the blocks here and all of the individual genetic variants shown in the peaks within these blocks. And not just look at one trait at a time, but look at all of the traits at a time. So type one diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol are, can be studied jointly and in fact compared to each other to understand where the signal is coming from and where these genetic variants are acting. How do we do that? Well, we can paint the same genomic coordinates instead of genetic information, now with the epigenomic information of all of the enhancers that are active in stem cells and all of the enhancers that are active in immune cells, all of the enhancers active in heart cells, all of the enhancers active in liver cells. And what we can see is a diagonal, genetic variants associated with height and rich in enhancers active in stem cells, genetic variants associated with type 1 diabetes and rich in enhancers active in immune cells and so on and so forth. This is actually real data taken from this much larger matrix, which allows us to now look at 54 different traits across 127 cell types. And what we see is again, genetic variants associated with height are only enriched in embryonic stem cells indicating that that's where they act. Genetic variants associated with the diversity of immune traits are enriched in T cells and B cells. Genetic variants associated with blood pressure are enriched specifically in enhancers active in the left ventricle of the heart, indicating that that's the tissue where dysregulation of these enhancers 
through the genetic variants is in fact leading to a change in blood pressure. And indeed, that's where the blood pressure gets built up before being pumped to the rest of the body. If you look at cholesterol, you see this very clear enrichment in liver, which makes complete sense biologically. If you look at fasting glucose related traits and other type two diabetes associated uh, loci, you see an enrichment very specifically in the pancreatic islets, which are responsible for insulin uh, regulation in our body and which are dysregulating type two diabetes. If you look at inflammatory disease, the bowel disease, we're ready to start placing some bets here. Inflammatory, well, I would bet immune cells and inflammatory cells, indeed, that's where you see an enrichment. And then bowel disease, well, I would bet digestive organs, and indeed, you see an enrichment both in inflammatory and in digestive tissues, indicating a dual action there. What about Alzheimer's? Well, we're ready to put all our money in brain, because clearly that's where we would expect it to, to act. But what we saw is actually no enrichment at all for brain, for Alzheimer's disease variant. And that was quite puzzling until we saw this very specific enrichment for CD14 monocytes. Now, CD14 plus is the marker of both the tissue resident macrophages, including the microglia that are the specialized resident immune cells of our brain, and also the circulating blood monocytes. And what was really remarkable is that that indicated that Alzheimer's disease might in fact have a genetic basis that is primarily immune based rather than uh, neuronal, which constitutes the majority of primary tissue. So most of the cells <coughs> are neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and to a much lower degree, microglia, pericytes, and other uh, blood brain barrier associated cells. So we repeated this experiment by extracting neurons, microglia, and oligodendrocytes and sorting them to carry out the same HCK27 acetylation chromatin immunoprecipitation experiment. And what we found is that the enrichment was indeed very specific to microglia, leading us to postulate many years ago that these conserved epigenomic signals in both mice and humans are in fact implicating an immune basis of Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, there's a major industry and academia focus right now on specifically microglia for Alzheimer's disease. And what we found quite remarkably is that if you look at the temporal progression of Alzheimer's in a mouse model, in early Alzheimer's, you see very rapid activation of immune processes. And only in late stages of Alzheimer's do you see this repression of neuronal processes, indicating that in fact, the neuronal changes might be downstream of the immune changes that happen early on. We have since expanded this analysis from 127 epigenomes to 834 epigenomes in a paper that uh, will hopefully be appearing in the next couple of weeks and is posted on BioArchive uh, since a year ago. And we went from 54 enriched traits that I showed you in the previous picture to now 534 traits that I'm showing here. We can put all of these traits into a series of pie charts, every one of which indicates the diversity of tissues within which every trait is enriched. And some traits like educational attainment, like schizophrenia and other psychiatric disorders, enriched very specifically in a single tissue, the brain. Kidney and filtration uh, enrich again in a very simple way. A lot of immune processes, including Alzheimer's, enrich very specifically in immune cells. But others are sitting here in the middle. For example, if you look at coronary artery disease, you see this very complex pie chart that indicates a diversity of implicated tissues. So this allows us to now start diving into some of those complex traits like coronary artery disease and partitioning their associations into the specific cell types that show this overlap. So if we take the subset of coronary artery disease associated variants that overlap liver enhancers, we see that they are enriched in very different processes than the subset of genetic variants that overlap enhancers active in coronary artery and so on and so forth. So that basically means that we can now partition this complex trait into effectively a series of parallel pathways that together contribute to the disease pathology. And if we in fact look at the comorbidity patterns 
and the co-association patterns of these genetic variants that lie in distinct subsets of tissues, we find very distinct enrichments in very different traits, enabling us to again take very complex processes and study only parts of them at a time through this lens of epigenomics. We can do that at the level of individual loci, looking at coronary artery disease, and then going down the list of the most significant to the least significant loci. We can look at the most enriched to the least enriched tissues and start asking, how are these genetic loci acting? And we've now generated these browsers that allow you to look through 30,000 different genetic loci that are enriched and that are lying within enriched tissues that allows us to now start dissecting their mechanistic basis. Here's one example that's been all over the news, PCSK9. This is acting through liver for coronary artery disease. And in fact, after almost a decade of intense efforts has led to one of the most potent drugs in this space, enabling us to now link this non-coding variant that is associated with coronary artery disease specifically to its target gene, PCSK9. Here's another example where you see these genetic variants are linked instead to these heart and vasculature uh, gene. And you see other genetic variants that appear to be enriched both in liver and in coronary artery. And you can indeed see that they are associated with both heart enhancers and liver enhancers, both heart genes and liver genes indicating this very rich multi-gene and multi-tissue pleiotropy in some of those sites. And again, we've made all of this information available. If you just Google EpiMap and Kellis, you'll be able to find this website that allows you to browse uh, tens of thousands of these loci in detail. So that's looking at reference epigenomes as if everyone in this chat room had the same exact epigenome, but obviously the epigenome varies dramatically from person to person. So the next thing we did is look at how genetic variation and epigenetic variation and transcriptional variation across individuals allows us to understand the intermediate steps of disease. What we're trying to do is take this very long gap between genetic variation and ultimately an organismal phenotype and break it up into the tissues and cell types, the specific regulatory regions, the specific target genes, and also the specific intermediate endophenotypes that are painting the path on the way to disease. And the challenge, of course, is that as soon as you start looking at these intermediate variables, the arrows from genetics that were previously one-sided, that were always causal coming from the genetics, now are in fact two-sided. They are correlations, no longer causation. If gene expression changes correlate with disease, they could simply be a consequence of disease, or they could be what's actually fighting the disease, or perhaps what's contributing to the disease, or perhaps something that's correlated through environmental changes with disease and the causality is flowing from the environment, or perhaps a response to treatment, or simply a spurious correlation that has no causal implications. So we need to develop new computational methods for inferring causality through these richer data sets. And we've done that in the context of Alzheimer's disease, looking specifically at DNA methylation variation and also transcriptional variation across hundreds of individuals as part of the religious order study and memory and aging project in collaboration with David Bennett from Rush University and Phil de Jaeger previously at Harvard Medical School now in Columbia. What we've basically done is profile genetic variation, epigenomic and transcriptional variation, and of course, phenotypic variation across all these individuals, and combine these to number one, understand how the genome influences the epigenome through the discovery of methylation quantitative trait loci or methyl QTLs. And then a uh, correlation between epigenomic variation and phenotype through a methylome-wide association study instead of a genome-wide association study, a GWAS. This is an MWAS that's basically looking at the bidirectional relationship between epigenomic or transcriptional variation and phenotypic variation. And combining these, we can now start inferring causality. How do we do that? 
Well, we start with methylation QTLs, locations where the genetic variation allows us to, in fact, predict methylation variation across individuals. And we found 50,000 genetic loci where we have this dramatically significant enrichment. P to e, P, the p-value is 10 to the minus 300. And the genome-wide significance after bonferroni correction is this red line here all the way at the bottom. And what you can see is that through these examples of varying degrees of p-value association, we have this remarkable ability to in fact predict the epigenome of an individual in their brain at 93 years of age from the genetics of that person at conception. Even before they're born, we can kind of predict what their methylation will look like in their brain in an inaccessible organ much, much later in life. Why is that exciting? Because we can actually not only carry out this methylome-wide association study between methylation and disease, which is bidirectional, but we, in fact, we can start predicting methylation through this methylation quantitative trait late locus analysis, predict methylation through hundreds of individuals, and then apply that predicted methylation to everyone who gives us access to their genetics. Because, you know, people tend to like to hold on to their brain until they're done using it, but they're much more generous about their blood. So we can actually carry out this genetic association across tens of thousands of individuals, even though our training set is only hundreds of, of individuals. Once we can predict this methylation, we can now carry out a correlation analysis between imputed methylation and disease. But this, in fact, gives us a unidirectional arrow again, because this is not all of methylation. This is specifically the genetic component of methylation, enabling us to say that, well, if I can predict it before birth, this is much more likely to be causal than simply a consequence of the disease. So using this approach of imputed methylome-wide association studies, we can now start predicting dozens of loci that are now genome-wide significant by combining multiple genetic variants to predict methylation level and then associating that methylation level with disease. And we can do that not just through methylation alone, but through transcription, through the combination of the two to understand the path of causality to disease. And that has, has allowed us through a tool that we developed called CAMEL for causal mediation analysis to predict not just genome-wide significant loci that are shown here in uh, purple and infer their directionality of effect and their target gene of action, but also in not genome-wide significant loci shown in gray here, many additional causal paths that reach significance only when you combine multiple variants together. And that allows us to now start predicting many additional drug targets even before genome-wide association studies reach that level of significance. So that's all at the tissue level, but of course the brain is an extremely complex organ with a diversity of cell types that have completely different roles and completely different biology. So can we move now from these tissue level view to a single cell dissection of these epigenomic and transcriptional differences? We've now started doing that systematically in collaboration with Li Hui Tsai's lab by profiling at the single cell level, more than 1,500 post-mortem human brain samples across a diversity of traits, including Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, ALS, Huntington's disease, psychosis in AD, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, Down syndrome, autism, depression, suicide, PTSD, aging, and many other disorders. And we've now, profiled, of course, all of the major cell types in the, in the brain. We now have more than 30 different cell types that we can reliably detect. And of course, across 7.5 million cells. So instead of having one map or 800 maps, we now have 7.5 million maps of the transcriptum and the epigenome across individuals. And we can, of course, profile both the transcriptional changes and the epigenomic changes and observe many different regions of the brain. So what are we learning from all these data sets? The first thing that we're learning is that there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity across these different cells. 
that excitatory neurons behave very differently from inhibitory neurons, very differently from oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, progenitor cells, or endothelial cells. The first dimension of variation is, in fact, the cell type. But the second dimension of variation is, in fact, disease state. If you look across non-AD versus mild AD versus severe AD individuals, and you can see here the cognitive uh, functions are getting lost as all of these pathological variables of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are increasing. These individuals are in fact partitioned to different parts of the excitatory neuron space. One subcluster is associated with disease, another subcluster is associated with non-disease. And that's not just true of excitatory neurons, but as we start subclustering all of these major cell types into <coughs> subsets <clears throat> of excitatory neurons, subsets of inhibitory neurons, subsets of astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and so on and so forth, we see that an unbiased partitioning is in fact leading to subclusters of excitatory neurons that are associated with high amyloid or low amyloid, with advanced stages of neurodegeneration and early stages, with advanced cognitive decline and early, with AD and non-AD. So that basically tells us that disease is in fact causing these global gene regulatory shifts across these cell types. The second remarkable lesson is that if you look at female versus male individuals, the female individuals have cells that are much more enriched in these disease states than the male individuals, indicating this dramatic resilience of female individuals at the phenotypic level, despite having much worse transcriptional signatures associated with Alzheimer's disease. We can also look at early changes versus late changes in Alzheimer's. And what we find is that the genes that increase early in the disease are extremely cell type specific, but the genes that increase in expression late in the disease are in fact much more shared between cell types and very often involved in stress response because of all the damage that's happening inside the brain. We also see that the differences between female and male individuals are enormous to start with. We have 3,000 genes that are differentially expressed between male and female individuals prior to AD, but they only increase with AD. We now have 6,000 genes that are differentially expressed between male and female individuals in the context of AD. And that basically tells that maybe we should be thinking about sex-specific and cell type-specific therapeutic targeting approaches. We can't just treat all individuals as having the exact same pathology and in fact, both sexes as having the exact same mechanisms underlying AD. So since that study, we've now scaled up dramatically to many more uh, tissues and samples and traits. So here's the different uh, traits that we're looking at. Here's the different regions of the brain and the different assays that we're carrying out for a total of 1,500 samples and 7.5 million cells. What are we learning? We just recently posted a paper on schizophrenia single cell dissection on Meta Archive, and I encourage you to Google that as well. And what we can see there is that when we look at the different cell types in the brain of schizophrenia and control individuals, we can identify not only all of the major excitatory neuron sub subtypes and inhibitory neuron subtypes, but also a new cellular state, this SCTR state, that is in fact associated with schizophrenia individuals, even when those individuals don't show global gene expression changes associated with disease. So that suggests that there might in fact be two different paths to schizophrenia. Some individuals show global changes across all of their cell types and other individuals don't show these global changes, but instead show this one particular cellular state of SZTR that cross cuts across layer two and three and layer four and five excitatory neurons. It is in fact, perhaps a separate path to Alzheimer's, to, to schizophrenia. We can also go to the genetic loci that are associated with schizophrenia from genome-wide association studies through a tremendous community effort involving many, many different centers. And <clears throat> we can now start asking, what are the genes that are in fact differentially expressed in schizophrenia at these loci? How many of them are in fact linked using high C evidence that tells us about the looping of the chromatin in three dimensions that brings together these genetic loci and these differentially expressed genes, whether they are positively 
or negatively in regulated in schizophrenia, indicating re risk inducing versus protective effects. And whether uh, which cell type specifically they are uh, differentially enriched, differentially expressed in. And you can see here this dramatic enrichment for differential expression in excitatory neurons, lower degree inhibitory neurons, and nearly absence for any of the glial cell types, but also this very strong enrichment for this SCTR cell state that appears to be a second path to schizophrenia. We can also use these to go upstream from these differentially expressed genes and then predict what are the master regulators that control these genes. And even though the differentially expressed genes themselves are involved in both synaptic signaling and organization and neurodevelopment, we find that the master regulators are indeed instead acting primarily in neurodevelopment. And we can cluster these regulators into modules of coordinate the express regulators. And one of these modules in particular is very strongly enriched for both neurodevelopmental disorders and for genome-wide association variants that pinpoint these regulators as causal players in schizophrenia, and in fact, acting in both early development and in adulthood, indicating perhaps a master regulatory role for these. We've looked at ALS and FTD and found, again, many different subtypes, including motor neurons that appear to have the strongest association of this regulation. And we're finding a large number of pathways that are differentially expressed across endocytosis, autophagy, transcription regulation, differentiation, signaling, and other pathways in ALS. And similarly, in FTD, a large diversity of uh, differentially expressed pathways. In the context of Huntington's disease, we basically find that the cellular signature of these indirect pathways, spinal projection neurons versus these direct pathways, spinal projection neurons, is in fact lost in the context of HD uh, of Huntington's. And the two cell types are in fact merging their identity. And these are known to underlie Huntington's, suggesting perhaps a new mechanism through which they might be acting. Looking at different regions of the brain, we in fact see this dramatic diversity of neuronal cell types, but also glial cell type diversity across the different regions of the brain. So yes, we can think of neurons as neurons, but depending on where you, where you look in both neocortical and subcortical regions, you see these dramatic differences. And these differences are in fact pinpointing specifically different pathways associated with pathology of neurofibrillary tangles and tau across these different brain regions scored in a region specific way. We can also actually use these single cell data sets to capture subcortical region specification and subregion spatial resolution based on the clustering and the subclustering of these cell types in single cell expression space. You can see here that the expression patterns when we subcluster neurons from the hippocampus are in fact capturing both granule cells in the dentate gyrus and these pyramidal cells across uh, these CA1, 2, 3 areas and the subiculum. And you can see that the spatial organization of these cells in the brain is in fact mirrored by the spatial organization and the distance in expression clusters of these cells in the single cell data, enabling us to in fact start inferring spatial transcriptomic information from the single cell data and start asking what are the major regions, the major regions where these cells are acting. We've also embraced, of course, spatial transcriptomics, and we've started looking at both control and disease brain samples in the context of SCA1 uh, disorder. And what we're seeing is that the spatial information is in fact revealing much more dramatic changes than what we would be able to see using just single cell information. That in fact, the organization of the, uh, the cerebellum is in fact dramatically altered in the context of disease. We've also used our single cell data for the match samples to deconvolve the mini bulk experiments of spatial transcriptomics into the individual cell types of each of these dots here. And what we can see is that these Purkinje cells that are in fact known to underlie SCA1 are in fact dramatically altered between 
disease and control groups, they have dramatically decreased their abundance, even though the marker gene itself of PPP1R17 expression does not show change, indicating the importance of actually carrying out this deconvolution. We've also done the converse. Instead of deconvolving these mini bulk profiles, we've also spatially augmented the single cell data by developing a deep learning neural network approach to start predicting expression localization of these cells from the single cell expression patterns of those cells, showing that in fact, not only neurons, but also oligodendrocytes and astrocytes show expression differences between the spatial organization differences of these cells. We've also been able to sort in silico tens of thousands of microglial cells and start distinguishing subtypes of synaptic microglia versus inflammatory microglia. And what we're finding is that the synaptic microglia appear to be acting primarily in schizophrenia, whereas the inflammatory microglia appear to be acting primarily in Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration. We've also carried out single cell attack seek, so DNA accessibility, to understand the gene regulatory regions that are co-varying with their target genes across individuals and across disease. And we find dramatic examples of co-variation between disease and non-disease and non-disease states across DNA accessibility and also RNA expression for every major cell type and many different examples. For example, APOE increases in expression in disease and in uh, Alzheimer's in this particular case. And microglia, uh, DNA accessibility also increases in expression. And we see many of these examples of coordinated changes between transcriptional and DNA accessibility phenotypes at the molecular level. We can use this information to now cluster the genetic variants associated with different psychiatric or neurodegenerative disorders into specific cell types of action. And what we can see again is that Alzheimer's clusters very clearly into microglial DNA accessible sites, whereas schizophrenia and other psychiatric disorders implicate instead excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And we can use this information to now start pinpointing individual driver variants within these microglial enhancers that are now associated with Alzheimer's and start predicting regulators upstream, including this PU.1 slash SPI1 regulator, which is a master regulator of microglia and which appears to be involved in many of the GWAS targets associated with Alzheimer's disease. Beyond common variants, we've also used the transcriptional information to look at mosaic somatic changes that are happening during brain development and recognize the increased number of somatic mutations seen in the disease individuals versus non-disease individuals and also differences between male and female individuals and cell type specific differences in the somatic mutational burden that accumulates in different disease um, states for different cell types. And that allows us to now start recognizing the complete other end of the spectrum from common variants to rare variants to somatic variants and how that is associated with disease. And we find that in fact, these cluster in very different biological processes that are implicated in disease. Very briefly, we've also integrated single cell data and bulk data across thousands of individuals. We are about to post a paper on bioarchive in the next 48 hours by Yongqing Park and Liang He that are looking at deconvolution of 3000 brain samples into these single cell profiles to start understanding how genetic variants are acting across a much larger cohort of individuals. And we can find in fact, genetic variation associated with cell type proportion changes inferred through this deconvolution through specific biological mechanisms. And again, once more, we're finding that these genetic variants appear to be acting very strongly in microglia. Across many different phenotypes, we're able to now uh, det detach, untangle Alzheimer's disease into neur neuritic plaque phenotypes, neurofibrillary tangles, neuroinflammation, and recognize the regions of the genome that are associated with each of those in methylation changes associated with different combinations of these phenotypic signatures of Alzheimer's. And those clusters that we're discovering are in fact acting in very different cell types 
indicating again that we can take these complex disorders and partition them into the specific sub processes that they're acting through. We've expanded this to look at electronic health records across thousands of individuals and recognize combinations of phenotypic variables that allow us to now cluster patients across lab tests, prescriptions, doctor notes, billing codes, and so on and so forth. And we can now start correcting these clinical records, but also associating these phenotypic subgroups with genetic variants that are acting in gene expression perturbations in a diversity of cell types. And what we're finding is this quite dramatic enrichment of blood gene expression differences associated with post-traumatic stress disorder consistent with a immune hypothesis uh, of an immune role in post-traumatic stress disorder. Beyond individual tissues, we've now started dissecting the combined role and the combined changes that we see of both exercise and diet in both human and mouse across a diversity of tissues in a large number of new collaborations. And we're able to, through this single cell profiling of multiple tissues, recognize a diversity of cell types and then find changes that are coordinated across multiple cell types in multiple different tissues, indicating that both immune cells and adipocyte stem cells are in fact major hubs of communication between cell types, both within a tissue and across tissues. And how exercise in fact reprograms the expression patterns associated with diet and obesity. And what we're finding is these cellular communication networks through the expression at the single cell resolution of ligands and receptors in matching cell types. And of course, the downstream target genes of those receptors. Beyond these inaccessible tissues, we've also been looking at blood biomarkers of disease. And in particular, looking at the epigenomics of AD versus non-AD individuals in their blood, enabling us to deconvolve these complex mixtures of cells from H3K27 acetylation profiling of uh, bulk blood into the specific cell types that are changing. And what we're seeing is quite dramatic. We see that macrophage deconvolved data is enabling us to start predicting Alzheimer's versus non-Alzheimer's individuals from their blood with 85% accuracy based on this area under the curve. And the genes that are predictive are in fact clustering in biological relevant pathways and very often implicate genes that are already associated with Alzheimer's disease, indicating that in fact their signatures can be visible in the circulating blood. We've also used these predictions of aging through the expression profiles to start inferring the aging rate of different individuals. And what we're finding is that faster agers are much more likely to have Alzheimer's disease and that aging in fact contributes independently to the APOE4 genotype to Alzheimer's disease, indicating two separate paths, one from increased risk and one from simply faster aging. And we've also used these blood biomarkers in exosomes in a paper that just recently appeared in the context of cancer in collaboration with Geneviève Bonan. And we've also looked at the convergence of these distal mutations in the context of cancer uh, in a paper that we posted on BioArchive as well. And we are now looking at longitudinal progression of disease to look at samples across time courses of treatment and to understand at single cell resolution how the immune system and the tumor interact in the context of disease. Lastly, we're putting all of these predictions to the test by predicting driver genes and the cell types where they're acting and the stage of development where they're acting through these genetic association studies and through high c data. And we've started generating organoids that systematically perturb these genes in collaboration with Kevin Egan, Kevin Smith, and uh, Maria Cusi in my lab. And what we're seeing is that these genes are in fact showing dramatic changes in synaptic density, in calcium signaling, and in multiple other pathways. To carry this out systematically, we've also developed this modular and programmable CRISPR-Cas9 constructs that allows to both edit individual SNPs, but also to knock out genes and promoters, but also to activate or repress distal enhancers 
by coupling DeadCast9 with activating or repressive domain, enabling us to carry out these changes in induced pluripotent cells and then differentiate them into different lineages to start asking how are these genetic variant effects manifesting in a diversity of different cell types. And again, doing this systematically, we can now start profiling in 384 well plates these changes in high throughput. Beyond these plate-based high throughput experiments, we've also developed these massively parallel experiments that allow us to carry out 7 million tests in a single experiment in high resolution, mapping the location where these genetic variants are acting and where these enhancer activity is driven by and specifically what regions are evolutionarily conserved and also uh, contain regulatory motifs based on this high resolution mapping. How do we do that? By directly extracting open chromatin regions through attack experiments and then inserting them 7 million at a time into plasmids that are self-transcribing constructs, enabling us to carry out these experiments in parallel and then measure based on the barcodes that contain the construct itself how much every experiment drives enhancer activity and then infer computationally in high resolution where those map and what are the genetic variants driving these differences. And in collaboration with Andreas Penning, we're now testing tens of thousands of these genetic variants in the brains of mice by looking at how they're acting, not only in cell cultures, but also in the context of a complete functional mammalian brain. So that's what I had to say in terms of the seven areas that we're trying to push for understanding the circuitry of disease. Number one, building these reference epigenomes to predict disease relevant tissues, combining genetic, epigenetic and transcription variation in the context of disease, dissecting at single cell resolution, epigenomic and transcription variation in disease in a large number of different traits, and then inferring cell type specific effects by integrating single cell and bulk data through deconvolution to understand QTLs at single cell resolution, integrating many different phenotypes together across medical records and looking at sub phenotypes of Alzheimer's. And of course, integrating many tissues together through these multi-tissue study of obesity, cancer, aging. And lastly, the high throughput dissection of this gene regulatory circuitry. We have been very generous. Uh, we, we have been very lucky with many generous institutions providing funding across Roadmap, ENCODE, and HRI, and many different NIH institutes, as well as foundations like Cure Alzheimer's. These are the awesome folks involved in these collaborations. Many of them have actually started uh, their own independent positions in some top universities. So we're always looking for great postdocs. So please do come join us. I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Et rappelez-vous, vous pouvez poser des questions en français ou en anglais. Attendez, hop. Ah voilà, Patrick, là je vous entends. Patrick, Patrick, tu n'as pas, tu as pas, des, tu as pas coupé, ouvert ton, ton micro. Ah, C'est bien là. Ouais, 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 là on t'entend. Ouais. Ok. Uh, so first question, perhaps, uh, what next? So do you plan to, to do uh, some uh, proteomic as well, uh, to to like to, to go from the genome to uh, the protein? So it's a, it's a great question. We haven't uh, yet. And the, part of the challenge is that proteomics hasn't yet entered the genomic era of super, super high throughput in a very cheap quantitative way. Um, we have some proteomic collaborations, uh, but again, there's a lot of technological innovation that's needed. And we've also started looking at metabolomics and lipidomics and sort of understanding, especially in the context of obesity and uh, exercise, how are all of these gene expression changes related with metabolic changes in specific tissues and what that teaches us about the downstream effects of these gene regulatory alterations. Okay. Uh, second question, perhaps, before anybody else raise their hand. Uh, do you have uh, found uh, in the cancer context, because you didn't talk so much about cancer, so what are the major differences uh, between normal and, and uh, cancer-associated tissue? So uh, there are a dramatic number of expression changes between normal and cancer. What we're studying right now is in the context of immunotherapy response, 
what are the genes that are changing during treatment and what are the expression differences early on prior to treatment when you first take the tumor sample that allow you to predict who will respond and who will not respond. And in a paper that we're preparing now, we're basically showing how both immune changes, immune differences between future responders and future non-responders, as well as tumor differences, allow us to predict the time course changes of the effect. And what we're finding is that the tumor immune interface is extremely important in that respect. And a lot of the genes that we're finding are in fact playing immune roles uh, in those si systems. Okay. Uh, Andreas Schedel. Yeah, hi, it's very interesting talk. Um, I have a question concerning um, the ENCODE project and uh, the epigenome. Yeah. Uh, one of the things which uh, always puzzled me with the ENCODE project is that all of this was done on, well, most of it was done on organs, which are often very complicated with many different cell types. And obviously, um, histone marks and um, also open chromatin, that's very different from one cell type to the next. I realized now, of course, with the multiome where you have attack sequencing and single cell attack single cell RNA sec combinations, that um, uh, addresses one of that questions. Um, but um, I guess histone modifications, for those you can't actually do at the moment a single cell approach. So how do you tackle that? And how important do you consider um, histone methylations in identifying, well, just open chromatin or specific enhancer regions, et cetera? It's a fantastic question and something that we have, you know, greatly, greatly, uh, you know, uh, studied. Uh, so there's, there's multiple ways. The first one is that you can actually sort cells in each of the tissues. You can basically start um, inferring, you know, from, from, you know, single cell attack data, for example, of those tissues, you can find markers for the different cell types and then sort sufficient numbers of cells to be able to carry out chromatin precipitation and new next generation assays that, that carry out the same information, um, such as um, cut and tag that allow much smaller sample sizes. So for example, in the brain, we've been looking at cut and tag for different transcription factors by specifically sorting neurons from those brains. So that's one approach. So the cell sorting approach. The second approach is computational. You can computationally deconvolve the chip seek signal by looking at the subset of DNA accessible sites that are accessible in different cell types of these complex tissues, and then projecting the chip seek signal, which should in principle capture these enhanced activity regardless of the cell type that it's active in, and then map them back into the individual cell types where they act. So both experimental and computational approaches uh, are being used by us and, and others in the field to do that. But that, that's a fantastic question. Okay, thank you. And maybe that just uh, carry on. So to what extent um, is now, because you have talked about um, sex in, in, in some of the your, your projects, to what extent is that now fully implicated in your analysis, um, ENCODE project, et cetera, et cetera? So uh, there are dramatic sex differences uh, in the context of GTEx. There's a whole paper led by Barbara Stranger that's looking at uh, sex differences in QTLs where the genetic variants are in fact sex specific. And, um, you know, so I, I really encourage you to look at that, that, that study, uh, it was published just a few months ago. And um, the, you know, the other aspect is that as, uh, as we're studying all of these different uh, variations, across uh, individuals, what we're, uh, just a sec, um, we are profiling both male and female individuals in all of these cohorts, and we're always using sex as a, as a variable in our regression frameworks, in all of our sort of studies. So we, we're finding that sex underlies nearly every single disorder and nearly every single tissue. And uh, I think that the field is embracing that more and more to realize that, you know, um, we have to, we have to embrace these sex specific differences, but also age specific differences, you know, condition specific differences, uh, environment specific differences, but sex is absolutely a major driver of variation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, uh, I, Jenny yeah. had, a, had a question. Jenny is asking, you showed a sex biased Alzheimer's genomic signature, but this did not result in more incidence of disease. 
you map what is buffering this signature. So uh, <clears throat> in the male individuals, we show this upregulation of myelination pathways in oligodendrocytes, leading us to predict that perhaps the incidence of Alzheimer's is higher in female, maybe because of a difference in uh, myelination. And indeed, when we saw, when we looked back at the clinical information that had been sitting around for many years, we basically saw that indeed female individuals had a greater loss of white matter associated, of course, with the myelination of neurons than the male individuals, suggesting that perhaps in female individuals, we have something very similar to multiple sclerosis, where you basically have white matter loss, uh, whereas in male individuals, you don't see as much of that, possibly because of a uh, response of upregulating of myelination pathways in oligodendrocytes. So again, the exact mechanism is not known there, but that could be one way of uh, mediating this. As for the reason why I'm calling female individuals more resilient is because we actually selected individuals with matched pathological and cognitive phenotypes. And yet we found that female individuals had many more, the, many, many more of these transcriptionally dysregulated cells. So that basically leads us to believe that female individuals have other mechanisms of resilience at the cognitive level and at the phenotypic level, but we don't yet know what these mechanisms are. I hope this uh, helps. More questions? Yeah. Uh, in your analysis of neuron, did you try to uh, analyze where where the memory came from, if you have some individual uh, and uh, to dissect the, the, the mechanism of memory. So we have a paper that just appeared in uh, Neuron in collaboration with Li Wei Tsai that's basically looking at memory formation. And in particular, we basically looked at um, shorting of cells where you can take a mouse, provide a particular experience, provide a recall, and a consolidation of that memory, and then look at the neurons that get activated at different phases. And what we were able to see is that if you actually sort the neurons at different stages of the memory formation process, you could actually see a role of epigenetic modifications in the neurons early on, even prior to recall, that gets consolidated with transcriptional changes only later on. So in a way, the genes that are, the, that are going to be changing expression during the memory consolidation uh, phase of these engrams, this combination of neurons that together fire and co-fire for memory formation, has in fact both a transcriptional and an epigenomic basis. So I, I really encourage you to look up this paper. And um, Marco Asaf is the first author. And uh, it was, again, published just a few months ago. So you know, it's, a, it's an enormous field. This is a tiny contribution of an enormous field that is mostly uh, unchartered. So it's a huge area, huge challenge, but something that we're actively working on. Okay. Is it any more question? Uh, so uh, after I got, sorry, I have still have question because uh, I, um, Dans les alors, je vais en français. Dans les expériences de single cell, ouais. en fait, euh, on, on, en règle générale, on n'a que les gènes les plus connus, quoi, les plus. Ouais, les plus et donc du coup, ça c'est jusqu'à quel point vous descendez et jusqu'à quel point en fait c'est relevant parce que euh, là c'est un vrai quoi. Il y, y a un challenge, c'est-à-dire que les gènes qui pourraient ouais. être vraiment peu faiblement exprimés, qui pourraient avoir des grosses conséquences. En fait, on les détecte pas dans ces analyses-là. Ouais, ouais, donc euh, le, le problème, je, tu veux que je réponde en français ou en anglais Comme tu veux. Uh, so the challenge, of course, with uh, single cell analysis is that uh, you're sampling a single cell, and that basically means that it's a snapshot of that cell over time. The problem with any one cell is that transcription very often works in bursts. So that basically means that, you know, the, 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 the particular snapshot in time where that cell was sampled might only have a biased subset of the genes in that. That's one challenge. The second challenge is, of course, that the, uh, that the most highly expressed genes will be more easy to detect just by, by the nature of it, because you're actually sampling individual RNA molecules. 
the way that we're addressing all this is uh, multifold. On one hand, we can cluster cells together into, of course, you know, extremely precise subcellular states and then have 50 or 100 or, you know, more cells that together capture an integration of that cell type over the bursting of uh, transcription and therefore have perhaps a more representative uh, view of the steady state of that individual cell type over a slightly longer period. That's one, one aspect. The second aspect is we can actually look at continuous signals and then the expression diffusion of every single gene across these two-dimensional embedding projections of those uh, cell maps. So even if any one cell is not very robust, together groups of cells become much more robust. So that's sort of, that's sort of the, 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 the second approach. And then the third approach is to actually not just look at the mean, but also look at the variation. So uh, heteroscedastic models are basically looking at not just variation in the mean, but also variation in the variance. And one of the things that we can do now is look at genetic effects that in fact alter the variance of a gene rather than simply the expression level of that gene. And that sort of gets directly at that aspect of, you know, is it that we can't detect it? Is it that it's too variable? Is it that it's, you know, sort of below the detection threshold? And for example, um, in any one individual, we may have only very few microglial cells. But one example that I showed is when we take these 1,500 brains, we now have, you know, 100,000 plus microglial cells. So that basically means that we can actually start detecting these lower abundance and lower expression genes with more uh, power across the many individuals. And once we've detected them, we can then go and study their expression by projecting back down into subsets. But now we're asking a very specific question for each of those subsets, giving us uh, power again. I hope that helps answer. Okay. Maybe okay. I have a question for Manolis. Go ahead. Very great talk, Manolis, and very impressive data. I have a question concerning obesity. There is a lot of evidence uh, indicating that obesity could be a brain disease. So do you have some project related to better understanding the how with such a fantastic approach and computational bi biology, uh, how changing brain region could influence eating behavior in uh, obese patients? Yeah, yeah, no, you're, it's a fantastic question. Um, there's no doubt that, and in my, in my view, it's completely clear, I agree with you completely, the brain has a tremendous role in obesity. Um, what we eat, what, you know, our taste preferences, how often we eat, how we sleep, how stressed we are, our behaviors, how much we exercise, and, you know, sort of all of these things are in many ways directed by our brain. And our brain itself is directed by both, of course, environmental, you know, early life experiences, you know, uh, socioeconomic status, and of course, genetic variation that is influencing uh, our brain. So uh, there's no doubt that many of the genetic loci associated with obesity uh, will end up having mechanistic actions that are going through the brain. In the case of FTO, uh, there is, in fact, a very leading hypothesis that suggests that in addition to the adipocyte-centric mechanism that we showed, that FTO, the FTO locus itself, might also be acting uh, in the brain. So that, you know, that's a very strong hypothesis in the field, and that's something that many investigators are, are pursuing. So I'm very open to, to the possibility that the FTO locus itself might itself be pleiotropic, acting both through adipose and through brain. But that's not the only locus. There are dozens of loci associated with obesity, and many of them are, are likely to be acting in the brain. So in our own lab, what we're doing is we're profiling uh, in, in human. Unfortunately, you know, <laughs> we don't have access to, to, to brain from these uh, individuals. You know, people are not as generous with, uh, with their brain. Uh, but for mouse, we, we are profiling you know, uh, the, the organs as well as the blood and as well as the brain. So what we're really hoping to do is be able to sort of look at this interplay between muscle, the role that it has in adipose and in 
also, number one, exercise rewiring the brain, but also correlations between brain differences and behavioral differences. So there's no doubt that exercise has a direct impact on our brain. So it, it doesn't just work one way, it works both ways. So um, it's, it's an extremely complex field. I think the brain is gonna be involved in many, many different disorders. We know from the fact that placebo effect even exists, that if you convince people that you're giving them something that will make them better, for nearly every disorder, it actually makes them better. So that basically means that our you know, behavioral and our emotional uh, components uh, have a direct impact, a physiological impact on disease. And I mean, on the stress level, we, we're all comfortable with that. Like if you're stressed, of course, it makes everything in your body worse. And maybe we should just think of it as alleviating stress. Maybe by taking that pill, it reduces your stress about the disease. And that sort of, you know, has an immediate benefit on obesity, but, you know, many other uh, disorders. Um, and, and I think that's a still untapped area. And through the in, immense collection of data that we're gathering now in, in the brain, we're hoping to gain insights into not just brain disorders, but also other physiological places where the brain has an impact. And just maybe another question, or a quick question. For adipose tissue, did you work at the sing, uh, with single cell approaches or single nuclei approaches for to have adipocytes, uh, battery adipocytes uh, in the in the analysis? The problem with uh, adipocytes is that they're yeah because it's floating cells and uh, so it's not very easy. But with single nuclei uh, approaches, maybe RNA sequencing, it is now possible to include adipocyte into into the game. So basically for, for, for uh, the adipocytes, we're looking at single nucleus, of course, because, you know, it's, uh, otherwise it, you, you, can't, you can't do anything. Okay. 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 Uh, there's have, some, there's uh, someone just, called Jampa Kovlovsky who wants uh, to, uh, to Oh, I see another, another question out there. So, yeah. yeah, I have the same actually. It's uh, there is, do you plan to do some association research with microbial ecology? And uh, I have the same question about microbiota. So, um, in the context uh, of Alzheimer's, there's a leading hypothesis that, in fact, infections and the history of infection of an individual has a tremendous effect on Alzheimer's. And we're now looking at COVID and specifically how the brain changes in the context of uh, COVID um, disease. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a huge interplay there. And so the thought that amyloid beta might actually be a defense mechanism of microglia and other cell types against infections. And in fact, there's a big fear right now that with this increased prevalence of coronavirus infections in young individuals, we're going to see a huge increase in Alzheimer's disease decades from now. And we saw something very similar with the flu pandemic, where decades afterwards, there was Parkinson's disease that was enormous in all of those individuals that were infected during uh, World War I. So, the interplay between the history of infections, our environment, our you know, immune response to various pathogens, including microbes and viruses and so on and so forth, um, has a tremendous effect in our whole body and, of course, also in our brain uh, dramatically. And it can have effects that manifest many, many decades later. So epidemiologically, this is an extremely complex uh, area. Uh, in Alzheimer's also, uh, obesity has a huge contribution. It's a, it's a huge risk factor for Alzheimer's, possibly through the increased inflammation that you see with obesity that then leads to inflammatory changes in the brain and ultimately leads to microglial dysregulation, as we saw, and ultimately neuronal phenotypes in the brain. So, uh, and of course, you know, with obesity, your microbiome has a huge effect on the way that you digest food, the way that you, you interact with, you know, the nutrition and all kinds of other uh, health aspects. So there's, there's no doubt, uh, again, that we're gonna see a huge interplay between the epigenome, the transcriptome, the you know brain diverse tissues and of course uh, the microbiome both internally as well as uh, interactions with pathogens but huge huge area thanks for bringing up that topic 
Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, there is no more questions. So I would like to thank you for all this talk, the seminar, and uh, all your answer and this very odd topic that you, you presented. So thank you very much to being there. And uh, I think that we really appreciate your, your seminar all together. Merci beaucoup, Patrick. Merci. Merci. Uh, bon, merci, Martin. Merci pour tout ce que ce qui est organisé. And thank you all for your great questions. Bye bye. Okay. Merci. Merci, merci Yolis. Et, et à tout le monde, donc, vous aurez la possibilité d'avoir euh, le lien pour le séminaire qui a été enregistré. Merci encore, Manolis, c'est de la part du Labex Signalite et on espère euh, te, te voir un jour à Nice. Ah, ah, là, à fond, impatient. Merci, <rire> merci. Merci. Et merci. Et merci. Merci à tous les participants. Ouais. À, bi à bientôt, on vous donne rendez-vous au prochain séminaire Labex. Ouais. Euh, euh, Peut-être, Patrick, tu peux dire un mot Non euh, Oui, oh. dans, deux, dans un mois à peu près, un autre séminaire aussi oh. euh, avec une... Euh, un autre intervenant prestigieux qui travaille cette fois-ci en Espagne sur les ARN non codants. Voilà. Ok, bye bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Ok. Uh, uh, je peux te garder une seconde uh, Oui, bien sûr.